Okay, well, let's start. Klaus, we know each other for many, many years, but it would be very helpful for everyone if you, in a few words, uh, summarize your background. I think you're an internet dinosaur as such. Probably invented a lot of things yourself. Please, if you say a few things. Um, yes, I started off being assistant of the CEO of Bertelsmann. Can and you hear that? Yeah. yeah. And um, I was in 1995, early 1995, I started to be employee number five or six at AOL in Europe. And then being in the board till we sold it to, um, to Time Warner again. And then I was involved in the setup of Freenet. Um, and uh, for two years, then I wanted to always invest. Uh, we decided that in March 2000, so uh, it put me into a long-term unemployment statistic because you couldn't invest. And after that, I specialized on um, consumer internet, uh, which and I was a little bit lucky because I picked uh, some of the better ones like King or Facebook or Spotify, and I keep on doing that till now. Klaus always surprises me with modesty. He sits today on the board of Spotify and is also an investor in Klarna. And what I find very interesting about Klaus, he's always at the right time, at the right place, and never missed a trend. And he has been a very loyal guest to Noah. And whenever he said something and predicted something, it actually became true. And we should talk about this in a while. Philip Freise, you're running the media practice at KKR. When we started working together, we looked at yellow pages and traditional media companies. Today, we talk mainly digital, and you are one of the few people I know from the private equity industry who had to change their jobs completely. And as Klaus adapts to new situations, also Philip managed to always be at the right time, at the right place. Please say a few words about yourself. Well, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. And talking of the right place at the right time, I noticed, Marco, that your beautiful uh, wife and your mother and father are in the first row. <laughs> so that shows you this is a real family company. We and have to bring some supporters, right? You, you can be <laughs> proud of what you've created. So I just want to say that for, for, you know, for your family. Um, I think all of us feel the same way. You've created an amazing conference. And thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. So in terms of your question, as you know, it's a bit back to the future for me because I started in 1999 with, um, you know, very much like what Klaus did at the time, uh, founding Venture Park. At that time, there was a huge excitement in Europe about the first wave of the internet. How can we help invest in this wave? How can we help entrepreneurs be global successes, etc.? I did a little detour. Um, as you know, at that time. Um, I was um, with Thomas Middelhoff, who also did a bit of a detour uh, back, you know, on the roller coaster from Bertelsmann up and down. And so I decided at that time to seek another platform. I think KKR is a fantastic platform for that. As you know, we have an opportunity to not only invest in fast growing companies, as we've done with Fotoya, you know, thanks to your help. I don't know whether Oleg is here yet. Um, he's one of the best entrepreneurs I've met in my life, and we're bringing his company onto the global scale. But importantly, what I think in Europe is important to note, innovation doesn't necessarily come only from small companies. It can come from within large companies. So I'm very proud um, of my seven years on the board of ProSiebenZ1, which now officially has become somebody wrote, the fastest growing profitable media and technology company in Europe. I think, you know, from where they came from, that's a huge achievement and it just, you know, shows where the role of later stage investors can be, it can be small, middle sized and big sized. And somebody told me that you placed a big piece of shares today in the market of that company. So Philip is not only making money on the digital side, but also on the traditional media side. Congratulations on this billion euro plus placement. So let's start addressing the question. Klaus, you uh, sent us one slide, and you don't usually use a lot of slides. And when I look at this slide, maybe you, you want to give us some words, <coughs> but it tells me that the market cap of the top 50 internet companies grew quite a bit. Is that what we are going to see in the future as well? Now, that is exactly the question. So the uh, question, as a, as a VC, you always have two questions. The first, in what do you invest? And once you are invested, uh, how long do you stay in? Which the later one being much more complicated than the, the first one. So I asked myself the question, where do we structurally go? And what is a, 
uh, a market cap for companies that become vertical killers. Uh, and um, I, I stumbled upon, upon a, a chart which shows that in average, the vertical killers in 2004 had between uh, one and a half and three billion market cap. And that totally changed from today's side. So if you look at um, the Netflixes or the LinkedIn's, they are more like 20, 30 billion. So my question is, is it because <clears throat> the, the, the polarization has become stronger or is it because the ecosystem is longer around and the companies had more time to develop, right? So, and especially fast forwarding five years, is it that then the perception must be that these vertical killers are all 25 billion plus, um, then of course I should stay in into the big companies, or is it that um, we, we have seen the growth and that this is a normal level where we, we end up? So uh, Philip, how do you feel about these billions and billions of companies? Some of them don't even generate profits yet. When you look at investment opportunities, what is KKR looking at when you invest? Obviously, you look at the underlying market and how big things can get, but do these valuations of a Spotify or Klarna, do they scare you? Twitter went public, Wix went public in Israeli business, trading at a $750 million valuation. Is there a business for you, or is Klaus developing his company so fast, so quick, so big, that for KKR, there's not enough to invest in? I would say, firstly, it's an exciting time to invest in the space. I think today, you know, more than any time in the last 20 years in Europe, um, there is real substance in the companies we see, whether that's Klarna, whether that's Spotify, Criteo. These are companies that are not only European champions, but these are companies that can be global champions. And so what we are looking at is less really the valuation than it is what Klaus has described, the potential for these companies to be global players, to show the growth, not in one region, but on a global scale, and to have intrinsic profitability and scalability. I think Spotify is an amazing company. I think Daniel Eck is one of the best founders I know. Um, you know, can that be more than a $4 billion company? Absolutely. You know, Netflix is a $20 billion company. Um, it's, you know, and this is an example for where KKR can help because what really will make the difference whether you are a 500 million company or you'll be a $5 billion or $50 billion company is who your investors are. Is your board value adding? Do you have the right people who connect you to the right partners globally? And um, are you going to be the winner in the race? Because a lot of these are, you know, winner takes all business models. Okay, so we learned that some companies, the market leaders in interesting large markets which can get disrupted, get a premium valuation. And people analyze and differentiate versus all the other internet companies. And then they do get a valuation probably a few years ahead of what they're promising today. So when you do look at investments, what is for you, Klaus, the kind of most important factor or factors when you make an investment decision? <clears throat> so I think as a VC, you always live in, in cycles. Yeah, so there was the B2C cycle, then there's a social network cycle. And it's interesting, the longer the view is, the, the more it becomes obvious that you only need to back the big ones that make a difference. Right, so in, uh, in 1987, uh, uh, Microsoft went to the stock exchange with a valuation of 700 million. And in 1999, it went up to 900, 619 billion. So that was a major theme. At the same time, you had the oracles and, uh, of the world. Then and in, the, in the 2000s, you had the, um, some e-commerce players and some apples, and now you have social networks. So what would be the next, next thing? I, I see that a lot of investors turn a little bit away from B2C and go a little bit more into B2B. And I think that's, that's, that's a correct observation uh, because we have to, to see, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid what's happening in the B2C now because the owners of the operating systems have become so strong that if you really build something that becomes very, very big, then you are still at the mercy of them 
yeah, to allow you to use the their, their operating system. Yeah? So the power has become very strong. Unfortunately, we in Europe don't have a single one that has a, owns an operating system, so we are always at the mercy of the US players. It, it reminds me a little bit of these big manta rays swimming in the oceans, where you had like the little fish kind of eating off those, like the ones with the whales or the sharks. But I think it's a very interesting point that we need to, be, we to visualize in Europe very clear. Uh, so because the operating systems are so important and because these players bring the operating systems to different devices, there are a lot of other industries at stake. Right? If we look at the Tesla today, Tesla today, it's not about the, the car, it's about the electronic in the car. Uh, and um, big players buying into Ubers uh, and having an operating system for the car, the likelihood that at some point the real differentiating factor of a car is the, the electronics and so a software game which then resides with the people having the operating system, that would basically jeopardize a little bit our car industry here, just restricting us to, 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 to do the iron and not the smart part of it. This is a huge point. I mean, the, the idea of Venture Park in 99 was already that large European companies, corporations have to really watch innovation that's happening because it will have an impact on their core business. What, what Klaus has just said is exactly that, right? So if you're Daimler today, uh, you better watch what Google does with Uber and, and Tesla. Or Bosch. Or Bosch, yes. Even worse. Uh, so. so we established one thought, internet is to grow. The good big players and in interesting markets are going to get valuations already way ahead of where they are today. But one or some of the most important features to look at, how do these companies you are investing in compete or partner with the big platforms, mainly Google and Apple, iTunes and the Google App Store. And I guess with the development of mobile, this is becoming more and more important. I mean, you have a panel on the future of TV, as we had last year, so I let Christian Wegner talk about it, but ProSieben Sat1 has a partnership with YouTube, so it's a very interesting debate, right? Do you as a large content owner and broadcaster use YouTube and Google as a partner, or do you see them as the main competitor? So the old theme of co-petition is, is very tricky here, and uh, you guys should ask that question to Christian, but ProSieben has decided to actually do, do a partnership and open up the ProSieben content onto YouTube, which some other broadcasters have not done. So Philip Klaus, as an early investor, originally an entrepreneur himself, says that these ecosystems, these big platform operating systems are for him one of the key things to look at when he evaluates business opportunities. How does it all fit together, basically? Um, what, what is for you the most important investment criteria? Are you looking at revenue growth, margin, management team quality, the market opportunity? How do you evaluate among all those opportunities you get every day um, the better one? I mean, you've got three criteria. The first is definitely the management team and the founder. I mean, Oleg is one of the best you know, founders and CEOs I know in the space. For us, the decision to back him to bring Fotolia to the global stage was really driven by him, but also number two was driven by the business model. So I would agree with Klaus, B2B is, is a key, key theme. Within B2B, you know, do you have marketplace scalable situations where first mover and scale effects can create a real barrier to entry. We're really interested in this. And number three, and importantly for who we are, can we help the company we're investing in with more than money? So for instance, um, on Fotoya, we own GoDaddy in the US, you know, the largest web hoster. Is there something that can be done when you host you know, a website, the no most natural thing is to actually buy an image? So is there linkages we can create with the 90 portfolio companies around the world we own? Or you know, is there um, direct leverage we can, we can effect? So we have a $10 billion IT spend across our portfolio. This is something that's really hard for a corporation. So if you talk to Time Warner or Bertelsmann or anybody promising you that a central person will effect synergies across their divisions, it's really, really hard. I mean, I've tried to do this 15 years ago. 
comparatively, it's really simple if a private equity firm promises it. Would it's KK one phone call. Would KKR invest in a loss-making internet company? The key is really the underlying business model and the scalability. So if I have a player which is intrinsically profitable in one geography but chooses to be not profitable in a few others because through quick scaling and growth the overall opportunity is larger, absolutely. So that sounds like despite the change of traditional to digital media, you still have to do a lot of work on the analytical side. Let's talk about this a little bit. Klaus, we were talking a lot in the past about the European ecosystem and you were often uh, in touch with politicians that Europe, especially Berlin, needs a bit more push from the political side that entrepreneurship, venture capital gets uh, developed. When we talk about valuations and what's possible, and we look at the US market versus <coughs> Europe, which is always the interesting question to look at the bigger brother on the other side of the Atlantic, some may think Europe is the best place to invest in and then exit through the US market as a lot of Israeli companies have demonstrated. Is there a valuation gap between European <coughs> and US <coughs> internet companies? Yeah, so I addressed it several times. I think it's not only a valuation gap. The valuation and the liquidity of financing is a strategic mean in the competition between the US and Europe, right? So if you look at a company, at my taxi and Uber, I think Nick Mavis has done a spectacular job. I think they are very close in terms of same number of, um, of, of bookings. But on the one hand, you have my taxi, which, which doesn't get a, a very high valuation, so it doesn't get a, a lot of money in because it's in Euro, financed in Europe. And on the other hand, you have a, 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 an entity with Google that has a very big vision, meaning a billion MAUs on, on, the, on, the, on the Google Maps uh, are used to put Uber in there and then basically creating the ecosystem and the operating system for transportation at some point in time. And this big vision is worth no, ma no matter what amount of valuation to them uh, because they will play it like the, the YouTube thing. They probably don't care if they put two, three, four, five billion in uh, or if it takes two or seven years. There is a, a view of an industry player that makes bold moves and therefore with very similar companies of size if you compare them in terms of the, at the stage when the decision was made. So the one through a, a strategic help and a different finance environment totally elevated to a global transport operating system for transportation and the other yeah, having to react to that but not being in the driver's seat because you don't have the ecosystem or the financing partner in Europe to support this kind of vision. So that goes back to your original comment around the ecosystems and you have to maneuver with or around the big Googles and Apples of the world. Um, does it also mean that European companies are at a disadvantage because they don't have these, usually they don't have these large 100 million plus financing rounds? Do they have to work harder? <clears throat> I think the history shows uh, with, with Klarna or Spotify or, or the, the rocket internet companies that you, you, will, you are in a position to get these big numbers in terms of fundraising, right? The only thing that you at the same time import with this is that you don't have European financing institutions or European-owned financing institutions that are in a position to do that. So you will have, in a lot of cases, uh, your American entities and very, very often these American entities then want the company to relocate to Delaware because that's their, their, their feel, uh, feel, feel well at home situation. And in this case, as Europeans and as European politicians, you have to ask yourself, that is a nightmare because at this position, you, know, you have lost this company as a taxpayer and the center of gravity of this great company then totally shifts to the US. So we should ask the question, not how big will it get, but how big could it get? if a few powers are set free. Philip, you invested with KKR into Fotolia, as you said earlier. It's a, it's a company where you can buy images online. In fact, when we started our M&A practice five years ago, it was our first deal where we sold the stake to TA Associates, later K KKR into the transaction. And it was very interesting in my salesy mode explaining uh, Philip the business. I also told him there's a US company called Shutterstock which uh, went public after you invested. And I told Philip, when Shutterstock will go public, you will be surprised about the valuation you will see. 
Um, I, I, w I wasn't often right in predictions, it's not my thing, but on that one I, I got a lucky shot because uh, Shutterstock went public on the US stock exchange <coughs> at the uh, EBITDA multiple it's trading now at, it's 50 times, five zero times profit, <coughs> has more or less the same uh, profit than Fotolia, and it's a multi-billion dollar company while you invested around a half billion into Fotolia. What was your immediate reaction when you saw the US valuation of an uh, equally sized peer uh, versus your Fotolia deal? I mean, it comes back to what Klaus said. What we are focused on is making sure that Fotolia becomes a global leader. It's already the number one in Europe. We're not focused really on the valuation every day. Now, clearly what the advantage of a US player could be is that they tap the capital from a New York Stock Exchange listing and basically swamp Europe and try to take those shares. Now, that's why we invested in Fotoya because we can, we can very much help with this. Yeah? So this is a, a race between a European champion and a US champion trying to find you know, who's gonna be the number one globally. And so my reaction to this is, it, it's, it's, you know, it, we obviously invested in the right space and my reaction was, how can I work even harder to make sure I create the linkages for Oleg? Um, you know, the good news is that Germany is the largest market in Europe. And with um, who we are, we are very good friends with all of the main customers of, of Fotoya. So, you know, it's really irrelevant what your valuation on the New York Stock Exchange is. If you can actually lend the founder and the team a hand in terms of making sure we sell more images, yeah? And so that's my day-to-day -day job. I'm not really focused on, on the valuation. However, did I Did you get a little bit excited? I'm, you know, I'm, I got excited when I invested in Fotoya on day one. I think it's a fantastic company. I do think that there's an opportunity for players like, like us, like myself, to, get, to bridge the gap. If you keep in mind, we had 30 plus, you know, digital IPOs in the US year to date. We only have had three in Europe. You know, Criteo went public in the US because there was no alternative really to do it here. So a lot of the founders, you know, who've built these amazing businesses face the choice between, you know, do I take US IPO money or maybe do I wait two or three years, take some money from a value added later stage growth investor like, like KKR and try to become a global player and importantly focus less on the quarterly reporting than I should focus on actually growing my company with the right help. Okay, let's summarize the session. I think we, we learned quite a lot. First of all, you had the right place. Internet is there to stay and to grow. And as we can see on the chart, it has made a huge jump over the last yeah, almost 10 years. And we expect more. However, the bad news is these guys to my right are becoming more and more selective. And they're looking for the big thing while maneuvering around the Googles and Apples and making sure to not be in their way, but be with their way. And what really matters, what we learned is the quality of the management team and the opportunity and the market position. Um, I would like to say thank you very much for, for this interesting session. And please mingle and find a lot of interesting businesses because Noah is all about bringing the company on stage which is exactly fitting the criteria you described in your panel. Thank you so much.